Hello, welcome to chapter 31, the age of limits to the age of Reagan. Okay, here are our highlights. Uh, it is pretty much going to be from President Ford, his short term, um, to Carter and his one term, and through the Reagan Revolution into uh, George Bush and then with Clinton. Okay, if you remember, uh, President Ford became president because uh, Richard Nixon's vice president, Spiro Agnew, resigned because of bribery charges. Um, president uh, or Gerald Ford gets elevated to the vice presidency and then to the presidency when uh, Nixon resigns. And so again, um, we talked about this a little bit. Uh, Nixon was pardoned by Ford and Ford's argument was that the nation needed to move past this long national nightmare as he called it. Uh, that all we would do is discuss whether Nixon did it or if he didn't and we wouldn't be able to get anything else done. So his rationale for pardoning him was that we just need to get past it. Okay. Um, a lot of people criticized it at that point, but I think historians have looked upon that decision as being correct. Um, so Ford's other uh, diplomatic successes, uh, he did retain Henry Kissinger, uh, Richard Nixon's Secretary of State. Um, Kissinger had a couple of noticeable accomplishments. Um, he helped set the accord for SALT II um, that limited uh, nuclear weapons further. Uh, he also helped uh, create a Middle East establishment or Middle East agreement for returning the occupied Sinai to Egypt. But generally Ford was unpopular with both the, um, with the left, with Democrats, as well as unpopular with the, uh, with the right, other conservatives. And so Ronald Reagan actually challenged him in 1976 for the presidential nomination. So President Ford won that, but was able to beat back Reagan's challenge, but it's definitely a sign that you're unpopular when somebody in your own party challenges you. Um, all you have to do is look at LBJ in 68. Okay, here's a map of 76. Um, you can see Jimmy Carter wins the election. Okay, so Jimmy Carter becomes president. Part of Jimmy Carter's uh, appeal to the American public, he he passed himself off, and he was for the most part, a simple, honest, uh, pious peanut farmer. Pious is he's uh, religi religiously devoted. So he's the um, he's an outsider, which is another attractive point. So after all the scandals in Washington D.C., calling yourself an outsider at this time and even today. Uh, helps you score points because you're not part of that uh, quote-unquote corrupt uh, Washington, D.C. scene. Um, so that sells Jimmy Carter to the American public. Again, he's a simple peanut farmer. We like to think of some guy in overalls, but he actually owns a multi-million dollar peanut farm. Um, so what did he do to tame stagflation? If you remember, that was a problem with Nixon uh, when he was in office. Um, he did raise spending and cut taxes, and that did have the effect of helping unemployment. So unemployment actually drops. Um, unfortunately, oil prices continue to go up. They go up 10%, and it's the energy prices that lead to higher inflation rates. Okay, and so what Carter did was he practiced a higher, or he, he pursued a tight money money policy. So uh, encouraged higher interest rates, and those higher interest rates uh, mean there's less money, less people, fewer people are borrowing money, and because fewer people are borrowing money. Um, uh, it's supposed to drive down inflation, but it also makes it quite painful. And so what Carter does, unfortunately for Carter, um, he kind of blames it on the blames it on the people. He gives us what's called a crisis of confidence speech, or a speech about the crisis of confidence in this country. And it's uh, later known as the malaise speech, even though he never used the word malaise. And what he argued is that it's uh, within the American public's um, uh, ability to control inflation and to help out the economy and to deal with energy they said everybody should turn down their thermostats and they should wear a sweater around. And um, initially it's received pretty well, but then later people people thought it was kind of a downer of a speech and that's why they call it the Malay speech because it seems like kind of a Eeyore type speech like, oh, poor us, you know, things are bad and we can't do anything about it. Um, and so it yeah, initially received well, but later uh, uh, people kind of turned on that. And so then we go on to Jimmy Carter's human rights and national interests, uh, the Camp David Accords. And this is one of the, he's actually, well, this is one of his big successes during his presidency. Uh, Camp David Accords is between Egypt and Israel. So if you remember, is, Israel is surrounded by uh, countries that don't like Israel, that uh, want to destroy Israel, drive them into the sea. Um, so what Jimmy Carter is able to do is bring them to Camp David, and he is able to get Egypt to officially recognize Israel, and I think in exchange, Israel returns some land. So the leader of Egypt is Anwar Sadat. Uh, the leader of Israel is Menachem Begin, and this is historic because, again, it's the first time a uh, Arab nation has 
officially recognize Israel. And for that, Anwar Sadat, uh, when he went back to Egypt, he is later assassinated by his people. Okay, the year of hostages. Um, Jimmy Carter's biggest failing during his presidency is probably the Iran hostage crisis. And so if you guys have watched Argo, the movie clip, at least Argo, and if you haven't, you definitely should go on YouTube, A-R-G-O. Gives that five minute clip, the opening scene, kind of goes over uh, Operation Ajax and how the U.S. helped overthrow the Iran Iranian leader Mossadegh and um, install the Shah and the Shah helped re repress his people. Uh, they The people actually overthrow the Shah of Iran. Okay, and that's the Iranian revolution. So Ayatollah Khomeini comes back from exile. He helps lead a popular Islamic revolution against the Shah of Iran. Uh, the Shah who is suffering from cancer actually comes to the United States for treatment. Okay, and he actually dies in the United States and the Iranians want his body back. Uh, Jimmy Carter refuses to send his body back because he's an ally of ours. Um, and so some uh, out of control, I think they're young people, college kids, uh, seize the American embassy in Iran. Um, nobody ordered them to do it, it's just kind of a spur of the moment, emotional thing. Um, they seize the American embassy, they hold hostages um, in the American embassy for 444 days. And this is part of Jimmy Carter's weakness that uh, he is unable to, to get them back. Okay, we freeze Iranian bank assets. Um, and we actually try a helicopter rescue, one which uh, crashes in the desert because the sand gets caught in the rotors. And it just makes Jimmy Carter look weak and makes uh, America look weak. And that's actually probably one of the biggest things that uh, bog him down. Um, the other things Jimmy Carter does during his, uh, during his with his foreign policy, he actually uh, gets SALT II pa uh, passed. So the accords were set by um, Gerald Ford. Um, SALT II, it limits long range missiles, bombers and warheads. Um, we resume formal recognition of China. Sorry, switching gears there. And lastly, because, uh, sorry, and I should have started off with this, Jimmy Carter has an emphasis on human rights, and national interests, okay? So he does what he thinks is right. Actually, under Jimmy Carter, we, we renounce our policy of uh, assassination as a foreign policy tool. Um, the other thing Jimmy Carter does is he turns over the Panama Canal. He signs over uh, the agreement to turn the Panama Canal over back to Panama in 1999. If you remember when uh, we got control of it, it was kind of under shady means under Teddy Roosevelt and the Colombians where we uh, encouraged a revolution. So that's the end of Jimmy Carter. Um, well, I guess not quite yet. We haven't hit the 1980 election, but Jimmy Carter's not doing so well, not in domestic policy, not so much in foreign policy. <coughs> okay, forgive my cough. Um, so the rise of the new American right, the Sun Belt and its politics. So the Sun Belt, again, is um, it's, it's southern United States. So going all the way from Florida, stretching all the way to Texas through Arizona. And the Sun Belt population, what happens, it, it starts growing during um, it starts growing during World War Two. OK, and so those people that are moving to the Sun Belt, they tend to op oppose the growth of government regulations. It's kind of like live and let live. Um, we are just fine on our own. Uh, the Sagebrush Rebellion are people out in the West. And it's kind of a weird mixture. So there's people out in the West that oppose environmental rules. You know, they just want to be able to kind of live on their own. They think about the lone cowboy stereotype of the late 1800s. Uh, they're also against developmental laws, which um, seems kind of weird because that means you can develop as you want, which would seem to run counter to that first group. But they kind of uh, um, both get along in that they, they agree with... Uh, that the government has too much uh, too much influence, and lastly, the Sagebrush Revolution. They they both agree that the government owns too much land. Okay, uh, so then we get into the suburban conservatism, and so again, part of suburbia, if you remember from the 1950s, is that idea that idea of homogeneity, that people are kind of the sameish, sameish, right? And so sameish, uh, not a lot of outsiders, not a lot of people different from them. They don't tend to live in those neighborhoods in the suburbs. Um, so that becomes kind of the backbone of the new right. Okay, the moral majority are evangelical Christians. Okay, so evangelical Christians are concerned with the, uh, you know, with the immorality that's going around. If you think about your 8 by 11 article from the counter about the counterculture, uh, the loss of religion from schools. So not only Engel versus Vitale were prayers banned, but also seemingly the separation of God from, uh, you know, from our school children there. So. Uh, that is the new American right, again, conservative. Here's a map. 
Okay, the new right under Reagan, though, <clears throat> um, it, Re Reagan is a little bit strange. So he's actually an early fan of uh, FDR and the, the New Deal. Okay, and so um, he's an early fan of them. He then kind of abandons FDR and the New Deal, becomes governor of California in 1966, and and actually probably before that, he's the president of the Stage Actor uh, Screen Actors Guild. Um, and he's combating communism in the Screen Actors Guild, and he kind of he makes this turn to the right, okay. And so the the new right they're against a lot of things. They're against uh, you know turning Panama Canal back over to Panama. Uh, I think one of his slogans was like, uh, uh, "We built it, uh, we own it, and it's ours." Or we paid for it, we built it, and it's and it's ours. Um, so they're against Panama Canal going back to Panama. They're against detente, you know, the relaxing of tensions with communist nations. They're against amnesty for draft dodgers. And so they're kind of like, eh, hardcore is probably too strong a word, but they're 100% American. Maybe that's a better description. Okay, so the rise of the new American right. And you guys, this is actually your 8 by 11 that uh, you will have next week. And so the tax revolt. So Proposition 13 uh, starts out in California. And in your eight by eleven, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a cough. Um, so the, what they do is they kind of they kind of latch onto this idea of the civil rights movement that the you know uh, African Americans are oppressed, the Native Americans are oppressed, and Latinos, and then women, and the middle class then takes on that mantle that they're oppressed. And so how are they oppressed? Um, what's happening with the rampant inflation? Inflation means prices are going up, including the prices of their homes. And so the tax revolt, Proposition 13, is, is about uh, uh, their property taxes. So essentially, their property taxes that they pay on their home is going up every single year, even though, and the, pr and the price of their home is going up every single year, even though it's the exact same house. And that's what makes it kind of obvious to them. It's like, I really haven't changed anything about my house, yet I have to pay more and more. And so they take that on. Um, uh, they get Proposition 13 passed. And so, uh, and they figure out that uh, attacking taxes actually is a popular idea. And so it's still true today. So it's not popular to, to attack programs. So if you come out and say you're against Medicare, it sounds like you hate old people. If you, uh, sorry, senior citizen. If you come out and say you attack, uh, you're attacking welfare, then you, uh, you're hating poor, you hate poor people and you don't want them to eat. Um, attacking taxes sounds, you know, sounds neutral. Like, hey, nobody likes taxes. And so attacking taxes is fine. But what happens is if you get less tax money, then you also have fewer social programs. And so now you're not really being mean. It's just the way it is. Okay. There's uh, Grover Norquist, the uh, famous conservative uh, anti-tax guy. Um, he had a famous quote that he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to kill government. He just wants to shrink it to the size where he can drag it in the bathroom and drown it in the tub. And so that's how you're going to do it. You're going to do it by cutting taxes. Okay. So the campaign of 1980, um, again, Reagan is uh, a sunny, optimistic candidate. Uh, he's going to restore American pride. Um, he wins in a landslide, so a uh, landslide 51 to 41 uh, percent, wins the popular vote in the Electoral College, and so we have a turn to the Republicans again. Okay, so the Reagan Coalition, it's uh, made up of these th groups, I mean, it's others, but these three groups. Um, so the corporate elites are... Uh, you know, backers of capitalism, so capitalism un, uh, unabashedly. And so what that means is that they see market solutions. So, you know, and this is different from Reagan, and, and this is part of the difference. So if you think about it, uh, under FDR, government was the solution, right? The New Deal was the solution, okay? Under Nixon, it's a government can't help, can't hurt, okay? Under Reagan, government is now the problem. And the solution is always market solutions. So that what that means is like you turn it over to the marketplace, let buyers and sellers decide, and that's how things will get done. So, for instance, uh, if schools are having a problem and we're not educating everyone properly, uh, we should turn it over to the market. So that's where we get charter schools. That's where you get online schools. And through competition, we'll all work to get better. Okay. Uh, Neoconservatives are the... Uh, are the conservatives, they, they are proponents and supporters of Western values, okay? That we don't need to be embarrassed about Western values, not, don't need to be embarrassed about America, um, and, and strictly anti-communist, okay? They are against communism wherever and whenever. Okay, lastly, the populist conservatives, 
Uh, these are kind of the outsider, non-elites, non-Washington, D.C., non-rich people folks that, uh, uh, that support Reagan. Okay, they're the everyday man that, uh, you know, when Reagan talks about the government being the problem, you know, they, that resonates with them. Okay. And so uh, Reagan himself in the White House, he's, he's a widely popular president. Okay, obviously, finally remembered if you uh, know any conservatives, uh, friends or family, uh, they, conservatives revere Reagan. Okay. Uh, he's a gifted speaker. He's personable. Uh, he's funny. One of the funny anecdotes from Reagan's presidency is that when he there's an assassination attempt on his life, and he's going to the hospital, and he's about to be operated on, he and he said he joked that he hopes the surgeons are Republicans. Okay. Uh, he himself, as president, um, he delegated responsibility, tend to let the people underneath him uh, run things, um, and he was just kind of the overall chief. <clears throat> okay, supply side economics, Reaganomics, it's also known as. Um, and the idea here is kind of, it's similar to the 1920s. If you remember, uh, Andrew Mellon cut tax during the 1920s. Now it's called supply side economics. And the supply side economics is what you should, what the government should do is cut taxes, um, cut taxes for businesses, cut taxes for the wealthy. What businesses and wealthy will do is take that money that they get and they will invest. They will build new factories, um, they will start new businesses, and they will create jobs. And so all those people that are on welfare and getting government aid, they won't need government aid because now they can work the jobs that are newly created. Okay, and so that's kind of the idea behind that. Um, additionally, uh, the deregulation, um, and I think this is still a principle of, of conservatism today, that the government gets in the way with their rules. Okay, so there's too many rules about what businesses can and cannot do that slows down business and so what we can do is kind of get out of the way and, and cut regulation okay the you know there's a faith that businesses will make the right business decision okay and what's good for them and what's good for their consumers okay and so that whole problem of stagflation and high interest rates um that's over after 1982 so actually the first couple of years of the Reagan presidency we, he's still living with that but after 1982 unemployment goes down uh, GDP starts growing and inflation is tamed. Okay, so we're off to bigger and better things here um, after 1982. Okay, the fiscal crisis, uh, one of the problems is that uh, we have soaring national debt. Okay, and just for your clarification, um, debt is the total money owed by the United States. Okay, and so nowadays I think it's like $21 trillion deficit that I'm spelling here on the side. Deficit is the annual shortfall that we uh, of how much we spend over how much we bring in. Okay, so annually, I think this year we almost hit a trillion or maybe hit a trillion dollars in deficit. So we spent a trillion dollars more than we brought in through taxes, and that trillion gets added to the debt. Okay, just so you understand the difference. And so the debt actually soars under Ronald Reagan. And so why does the debt soar? Um, entitlement program store. So entitlement programs are like Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare. Um, those folks will always get their money, and so we and we have to pay them. Um, but the other reason the the other reason the debt soars is because of uh, the tax cuts. So when you cut taxes, when you cut taxes, um, you bring in less money, obviously. And then when you continue to spend money, and what we spend money on is the military. Um, that will drive up the national debt. And so the national debt, I believe, triples under Ronald Reagan from 1.5 trillion to 4.5 trillion. Okay, and that sounds quaint nowadays when we have a $21 trillion debt, uh, but that's what it was back then. Uh, the welfare benefits cut, and this is uh, Ronald Reagan uh, gets credit for kind of popularizing the idea of the welfare queen. And so the welfare queen um, is, uh, is some, you know, single mother that has multiple children by multiple fathers and she's collecting welfare but drives a cadillac and is eating steak and she's kind of like scamming the system and so you know welfare when you ask when you after this after when you ask people do you support welfare people said no and when you ask them do you support helping people in need they said yes and the actual welfare queen that reagan was referring to was this woman she was some of those things were true but what happened was she was actually just ripping off the system so she had fake ids she's collecting welfare under different names um, but that became the uh, prototype that Reagan railed against when he talked about welfare and why, you know, why we shouldn't have welfare. <clears throat> okay. Um, here is a graph about the federal budget surplus and deficit. 
uh, you look, look at that on your own. Okay, so going to Reagan and foreign policy. Um, so uh, Reagan, when he comes in, he is uh, tough against communism. Okay, and so the Reagan doctrine is he's going to oppose communist governments anywhere. Okay, and that for that what that means is uh, primarily in Latin America. Uh, so one of the places in Latin America is Hon uh, Honduras. Um, there is a sand. Okay, this, so this uh, you'll hear it for the first time here. Sandinistas are kind of they're uh, not kind of they are communists. They're not so closely tied with the Soviets, but to us, any communist is the same. Uh, the Contras are the rebels that are fighting the Sandinistas, okay? And the Contras are anti-communists. Because they're anti-communists, uh, we support them, okay? And again, anti-communist doesn't mean that they're good people. It just means that they're against communism, and they actually do some really bad things, okay? Uh, what else can Reagan do to uh, be tough on communism? He proposes the Strategic Defense Initi Initiative, also known as Star Wars. And so he's going to build some satellites in space, and we're going to shoot down missiles uh, with lasers as they uh, get sent over to the United States. It doesn't have to actually work. Other presidents have tried it. Uh, well, it doesn't work with high success rates. I think, I want to say they knocked down like 25% of the missiles, which is pretty good, I guess, if you're shooting lasers from space, but not so good if you got the other 75% of the missiles coming towards your country. Um, Reagan's, aside from the communism, Reagan's other big struggle is uh, with terrorism. Okay, and during this time, the 80s, when terrorism becomes a uh, tactic by other groups that are against America. And so one of the uh, our first experiences with terrorism, um, we actually send troops to Lebanon, uh, to Beirut, the capital of Lebanon. Uh, Israel had invaded Lebanon to chase out the terrorists that were attacking Israel. Uh, we stationed troops in the airport barracks there, and there's a truck bomb that blows it up and uh, kills 200 Americans, and we pull out of Beirut. Um, election of 1984, uh, you know, Reagan, uh, Reagan runs on this policy of, uh, on this policy, this uh, slogan of it's morning in America, and again, we can be proud in who we are, and America's back. Uh, he's wildly, wildly popular. Um, he is able to, um, he's able to beat Walter Mondale, who has the first female vice president, Geraldine Ferraro. Uh, that doesn't really help him with the women's vote. And as you can see, Rick wins in a landslide. He wins every single state except for Minnesota. And that's where Walter Mondale's from. <coughs> Sorry, I got a cough. Okay, the, uh, so the waning of the Cold War. Uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, it really starts with uh, the ascension of Mikhail Gorbachev. Guy below with the, uh, the birthmark on his forehead. So Mikhail Gorbachev, he is seeking to reform Russia. And so two words, uh, sorry, you'll have to get this from the book. Uh, two words that he, two policies that he pursues. He pursues glasnost, which is political openness in the Soviet Union, and perestroika, where he wants to reform the economy. So glasnost and perestroika, he is relaxing the uh, kind of some of the Soviet rules there. Um, and so he's beginning to relax the Soviet rules and you know, he's trying to unwind it and trying to open up society. Um, and one of the things that he does, I mean, he works with Reagan. And so first Reagan talks tough with them, then be, they become partners. Um, and the Cold War gradually winds down as the Soviet Union winds down. Okay. Other, uh, other things with the communist world, you have, uh, in 1989, I don't know why they put it here. In 1989, you have Tiananmen Square, where there's a democratic uprising in China. And it's really not to overthrow the government. They just want more democratic reforms. One of the things you should have learned in your world history class was Tank Man, as he's called, this ordinary guy that's standing in front of this column of tanks, refused to move, and uh, luckily some of his friends grabbed and ran out. The democratic reforms never happened in China. So, in fact, if, you, if you're if you in China and you Google, or you can't Google because Google's not there, if you try to look up Tiananmen Square protests, it doesn't exist. There will be no hits on that. Uh, in fact, there is no official record of how many people died during the Tiananmen Square protest, even to this day. So... Um, what happens in South, oh, I'm sorry, one other place, South Africa, you have the end of apartheid. So things are changing around the world. Uh, by 1991, the Soviet Union falls apart. Okay. Uh, Soviet Union, uh, dissolves, no longer there. And actually before that, 1989, the Berlin Wall starts to come down. Okay. And I don't know why we skipped ahead with all that because Reagan, we're still talking about Reagan. But anyways, 
it's really under Reagan and uh, conservatives love Reagan and uh, part of his legacy is that he stared down communism. He got them into the spending war. They couldn't keep up and their economy fell apart and that's why we won the Cold War. Um, that's their argument. Other side would argue that no, indeed, the Soviets were rotting from inside, kind of like a rotten apple rotting from the inside, um, and then they just kind of fell apart. So, um, you know, believe what side ever you want. So uh, that's Reagan and Gorbachev. Sorry, I guess I gave away most of it on the previous slide. Uh, they do become partners. And so Reagan, one of his famous lines to Mr. Gorbachev is, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And the funny, well, the kind of funny part is that he was trying to, but uh, by Reagan saying that it actually made it harder on him because now it looks like he's, you know, capitulating to Reagan when he really wasn't. That was his aim all along. Um, okay, the what really was the sign that, um, uh, you know, that they're getting along? 1988, they signed the uh, INF Treaty. INF stands for Intermediate Nuclear Forces uh, Treaty. It eliminates intermediate nukes and what are intermediate? The medium range missiles. Okay, and actually, if you any of you guys pay attention to politics nowadays, uh, that just was uh, walked away from by the Soviets or by the Soviets, by the Russians as well as the United States. We thought they were cheating. Uh, I think they didn't like us saying that they're cheating and they didn't trust us. And so that just kind of falls apart now. So uh, the last thing, uh, savings and loan crisis, because part of the, one of the aspects of deregulating businesses is a savings loan industry, which is kind of like, a bit like banks. Uh, there's a big crisis, uh, lots of scams going on, to the tune of billions of dollars. And because of the federal guarantee with bank deposits, uh, the government has to bail them out to billions of dollars. Probably the biggest stain on Reagan's legacy, though, is the Iran-Contra scandal. Scandal, sorry, not scandal. Uh, scandal. So the Iran-Contra scandal, um, what that said, so Iran, if you remember the last time we talked about Iran, they had held their hostages. Oh, I forgot to mention. So the hostages were held for 444 days. They were released on Reagan's inauguration day, 1980. Okay, much to the sadness of Jimmy Carter, he worked really hard in his last uh, months to get the hostages out. And they were released on Reagan's inauguration day. So anyways, uh, Iran actually needs replacement parts for many of their weapons because we had sold them weapons when the Shah was in power. They're now fighting Iraq. And some of those weapons and planes, they need replacement parts. They don't have replacement parts. Um, however, we do. And so we sell Iran replacement parts and we take that money and we give it to the Contras. And the Contras, if you remember, are the rebels. Um, I'm sorry, I think I might have said Honduras. Uh, Nicaragua um, are the rebels in Nicaragua that are fighting the Sandinistas. And the Congress had actually cut off some uh, money to the Contras because there's some atrocities, human rights violations that the Contras are doing. I want to say they raped and killed four nuns. So Congress had cut off money to them. Reagan uh, and his administration wanted to still give money to them. So it's kind of like a bake sale with weapons. We sell uh, replacement parts to Iran. We take some of that money. We give it to the Contras. Contras um, and then that all kind of comes out in the open. And it's, it's, it's ugly for Reagan. And so Reagan says uh, he didn't know about it. It must have been his underlings. And so that's Oliver North but on the Time Magazine cover, um, who's actually the president of the NRA right now. And so uh, his under, some one guy dies, one guy's charged. Uh, but essentially, it makes Reagan look really bad. So either he's lying and he was responsible for it, just like, you know, think about Nixon and Nixon always denying culpability or his underlings are doing this and he doesn't know about it. So either way, it kind of makes Reagan look bad. Um, he survives, he doesn't get impeached, he doesn't, uh, you know, he faces a lot of criticism, his popularity dips, but I mean, he, he survives in his presidency. Okay, that brings us up to 1988. <coughs> Excuse me, cough. Um, George Bush, who is George Bush, who is uh, Reagan's vice president, runs for presidency. Uh, he's accused of being a wimp um socially and culturally and so he turns negative his campaigning his opponent democratic opponent is michael dukakis uh governor of massachusetts michael dukakis to kind of toughen up his image he gets in this tank ride puts on this uh, helmet you can see below and people said he kind of looks like snoopy and so much for the tough guy uh tough guy image looks like snoopy bush's famous uh, or infamous lines now you know no new taxes 
uh, this is campaign promise. And so Bush wins election. And so now we have 12 years of the presidency or 12 years, 12 years of Republican presidency, eight under Reagan, four more under, four more under President Bush. Okay, so the first few, uh, first Bush presidency, um, there's a lot of political gridlock. Um, what happens is uh, he promised no new taxes, but then he gets a look at the national debt and the growing national debt and the problem that's going to cause. And probably to Bush's credit, uh, he agrees to raising taxes. Okay, so to tame the debt, that was seen as a huge problem back then, that uh, he agrees to raise taxes. And of course, that draws the ire of his conservative supporters because he promised no new taxes, but he does. Okay, the other thing that's problematic for Bush and probably dooms his presidency is the 1990 recession. So 1990 recession, that's halfway through his presidency. It will still be in recession by the time he runs for re-election in 1992. Um, and they used to say, there's a famous line by a political advisor said, it's the economy, stupid. And so for all your other stances, it's really about the economy. When the economy is going well, presidents get re-elected. When the economy is not going well, the opposition tends to win. Okay, and that held true in 1992. Okay, President Bush's first Gulf War uh, policy Okay, so what happens with President Bush, uh, we are living now in a unipolar world, okay? It's not a it's not a world with two superpowers. The Soviet Union has fell apart. It's just us. Okay, so what does uh, President Bush do? A couple of things he does, uh, he invades Panama. And so Manuel Noriega, who's the president of Panama, who used to be one of our allies on the CIA payroll, he uh, we accuse him of helping run drugs into America. And so we invade Panama to capture him. This is one of the very funny stories of the of the Bush presidency, he Manuel Noriega runs into the uh, into the church. And so of course we don't want to invade the church because that's going to make us look bad, and he won't come out. So how do you get a guy out of church that won't come out? You shine the spotlights on it 24 hours a day. You play heavy metal music. I want to say it's Def Leppard, and eventually he comes out. Uh, he goes to Miami, is charged and convicted, and actually I think he's still sitting in a Miami federal prison right now. Um, and it's weird. He had a pen pal at one point. I think uh, some middle school age girl that wrote him. So uh, that aside, the first Gulf War, Iraq, again, this part of our sordid history with Iraq, uh, they invade Kuwait, their neighbor. They, they accuse Kuwait of draining too much oil from the common oil field underneath them that they share. Uh, we're worried about, so one, they'll have um, control over a larger percentage of uh, oil reserves in the world. Um, so we get a UN action. It's not just the United States. We get a UN action whose job is to kick Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. Okay, so we invade. It's a popular war. Um, we, you know, we kick Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. We're chasing him. We're actually we're into Baghdad, and this is where it gets troubled. Some people, including his son George W. Bush, says that George Bush should have uh, captured Saddam Hussein and Saddam Hussein and put him on trial. Um, others say, no, the mandate from the UN was to kick Iraq out of Kuwait. And that's what we did. And uh, later Colin Powell calls it the pottery barn rule that if you break it, you own it. Right. So if we would have toppled Saddam Hussein at that point, we would have owned Iraq in terms of like we're, we'd be responsible for governing it for it. OK, uh, but what this means for the rest of the Middle East world is now that there's this U.S. presence in the Middle East that they're not uh, so keen on. And they're fearful of the U.S. influence in the Middle East. In the picture on the bottom left, one of the things that uh, Saddam Hussein did was that he set the oil fields on fire. Okay, this, I don't know, sour grapes. Okay, the election of 1992, we actually have a third party candidate, uh, Ross Perot, the guy with the big ears, that's what he's known for down there. He's a billionaire, starts uh, EDS, electronic data systems, who, when he sells it to GM and then buys it back later. <clears throat> he spins off from the Republican Party. He runs as an independent. So the Democrats, you have Bill Clinton, the man from Hope, Arkansas, um, famous for playing a saxophone on uh, Arsenio Hall, I believe it was, a late night show. And so you have Bill Clinton, Ross Perot, and George W. George, uh, not George W. George H. W. Bush, okay, running. And the big issue in 1992, this actually is the start of uh, Chapter 32, so we'll, well, I'll just give away now. So the big issue is whether we should sign NAFTA. NAFTA is the global trade agreement between U.S., Mexico, and Canada. Okay, and NAFTA would get rid of all trade barriers, all tariffs between the three countries. 
Um, Bill Clinton is for it with some with some stipulations. Uh, Ross Perot was against it. His famous quote during the debates was, "If you pass NAFTA, you're going to hear a giant sucking sound of jobs going south." Okay, and uh, George H. W. Bush is in favor of it. Okay, and so it's tough. It's a tough stand. And so generally, that's a Republican stance that they are against tariffs and they're for free trade. Democrats are generally against free trade because that tends to destroy, take away jobs, including many union jobs. And so it was strange for Bill Clinton for to split hairs there. Ross Perot uh, is against it, obviously. And so Bill Clinton wins 43% of the popular vote, which is far less than 50%. So he doesn't really have a popular mandate uh, to do anything. Um, uh, Bush wins 38%, and Perot, uh, for a third-party candidate, wins 19% which is one of the best showings by a third party candidate in US history. So there you have it, there's chapter 31. Hope you enjoyed today's lecture. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and buy the merch. Have a great night, everyone.